there are a million films that investigate whether the JFK assassination was a conspiracy. This is not one of them. This is an investigation into why so many people are still debating the JFK assassination more than 50 years later. The answers tell us a lot about why we believe conspiracy theories, and anything else for that matter. It turns out our brains have evolved these fascinating quirks that prime us for conspiracy thinking. All we need is the right set of circumstances to set us off. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. In episode one, we learned that conspiracy theories can be tools for dealing with loss and anxiety. And few events created a bigger sense of loss for America than Kennedy's assassination. How could we possibly feel safe if our government couldn't even protect its own president? Every time the government fails to predict an attack, there is a conspiracy theory. Americans say, how could they have failed so badly? Perhaps they were actually in on it. The JFK assassination set off alarm bells in our brains. Something just didn't feel right. That is intuitively unsatisfying to say that a lone gunman could get out of bed one day and change the course of history. And so we go looking for bigger explanations and a vast, faceless, all-powerful conspiracy that fits with our intuition that such a big event must have had a big cause. Cognitive scientists have a name for this intuition. They call it proportionality bias. The tendency to believe that a cause must be equal in magnitude to the effect. Most of the time, small efforts yield small results, and big efforts yield big results. So our brains assume this relationship holds true, even when it doesn't. JFK, you know, the leader of the free world, is assassinated by who? Some lone nut never heard of? Here's JFK, here's Oswald. There's an imbalance there, so you have to balance it. This man, James Fetzer, says there were no fewer than six gunmen in Daly Plaza. Of the four shots that hit JFK, the first was fired from the top of the county records building. The second was fired from the inside of the triple underpass. The third shot was fired from the Dal Tex. The fourth shot fired from the intersection of the triple underpass and the picket fence. Pretty soon, Madison Square Garden couldn't fit everybody that was involved in the JFK, but that kind of balances it out. By contrast, let's consider a different day and a different lone gunman. There it is. The president was hit. Shots were fired apparently at President Reagan as he was coming out of the water. The attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan was a similar event in all regards, except that the president survived. It was a smaller event in terms of its outcome, and therefore we are satisfied with smaller explanations. And so there have been almost no conspiracy theories about the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan, either at the time or subsequently. After proportionality bias primes us for conspiracy thinking, another mental shortcut helps us confirm our suspicions. Once we form a belief, we cling to it no matter the facts. It's called confirmation bias, and study after study shows that we all experience it all the time. In one study, people were asked whether they thought the JFK assassination was a conspiracy. Then they were shown a mix of evidence, both for and against. Both sides claimed that the same evidence confirmed their beliefs. Each side trusted the data that supported their theory and discounted data that didn't. Our minds operate more like lawyers than scientists. You know, the point of a lawyer is to defend your client to the best of your ability, even if that means distorting evidence, burying evidence, slanting evidence. We evolved confirmation bias for a good reason. Most of what was true yesterday is still true today. And if we changed our minds every time a new piece of information came our way, our heads would explode. But in today's world of alternative facts, it's a little too easy to find evidence that confirms any hunch. The JFK assassination has produced thousands of public documents that can be scanned for confirming evidence, like this photo of the presidential motorcade at the time of the assassination. Here in the background is the doorway to the Dallas Book Depository. 
Who is this blurry figure? Some say it looks an awful lot like Lee Harvey Oswald, which would be significant because at this moment, he should be six flights up shooting the president. Lee Oswald was framed. We've even been able to prove that he was actually standing in the doorway of the book depository. But to a lot of cognitive scientists, this connection shows another quirk in our brains called patternicity. So patternicity is the tendency to find meaningful patterns in both meaningful and meaningless noise. The reason for this is that our brains are pattern-seeking devices. And it took them millions of years of evolution to get that way. Imagine you're a hominid three million years ago, and you hear a rustle in the grass. What is that? Is it just the wind, or is it a dangerous predator? If you assume that pattern, that noise, is a dangerous predator and it turns out it's just the wind, that's a low-cost error to make. You just become more vigilant and cautious. But if you assume that the rustle in the grass is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, congratulations, your lunch. So it's a good thing to assume patterns are real. We oversee patterns because it helped us survive when quick decisions meant life or death. But it also leads us to connect dots that aren't really connected. I mean, is this photo a clue to cracking the JFK conspiracy? Or is it Billy Lovelady, a guy who was laying flooring at the book depository that day in 1963? He and several witnesses testified to the Warren Commission that it was him in the photo. All of us, left, right, street smart, and book smart, have the same cognitive quirks baked into our brains, just waiting for the right set of circumstances to send us down the conspiracy rabbit hole. But there's one more element any good conspiracy theory requires that doesn't live in our brains. The new president, Lyndon Johnson, appointed a commission to investigate who killed Kennedy. When the assassination happened, LBJ suspected people would blame the Russians, and it would lead to a nuclear war. So he tried to hurry the inquiry through, and so when people feel that it wasn't done entirely properly, they're onto something. That rushed investigation planted the seeds of suspicion. Then, a few years later... People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Watergate spurred a number of investigations by the press and Congress that then disclosed a whole lot of other real government conspiracies. By the late 70s, the percentage of Americans who believed JFK conspiracy theories spiked it over 80%. In 2017, when the government finally unsealed more classified JFK documents, it only made some people more suspicious. Some of this material is still redacted, and you're not really seeing a meaningful effort on their part to tell the truth. Conspiracies happen, and governments keep secrets. So how do we know where to draw the line between being prudent and being paranoid? More on that in our next episode. When you have your grandfather telling you about growing up in Mississippi or Alabama, and how the white doctors did A, B, and C, automatically in your brain, you're gonna be thinking like, I can't trust these people.